And we as human beings have this special gift. We have the gift to change things. Hello, welcome to Nature Magic. Today I'm talking to Dr. Joseph Bruchak, proud Nulhegan Abenaki citizen and respected elder of his tribe. For over 40 years, Joseph Bruchak has created literature and music that reflects his indigenous heritage and traditions. He is the author of more than 170 books for children and adults. His best-selling Keepers of the Earth, Native American Stories and Environmental Activities for Children series, with its remarkable integration of science and folklore, continues to receive critical acclaim and to be used in classrooms throughout the USA. You might wonder why I introduced Joe as Dr. 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 He was joking beforehand that he has three degrees, an initial degree in wild plant conservation, a subsequent degree in creative writing, and an honorary degree as Doctor of Letters from Albany University. His work has won many honors. His book, Jim Thorpe's Bright Path, won the Carter Woodson Book Award. He holds, among many others, a Rockefeller Humanities Fellowship the Cherokee Nation Prose Award, and the Storyteller and Writer of the Year Awards from the Wordcraft Circle of Native Writers and Storytellers. Joe was an absolute joy to interview with his singing and drumming adding to the delight, and our chats before and after were full of laughter. A really fun and generous person. Um, hello, Dr. 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 Joseph. Bruchak, and you're very welcome to the Nature Magic podcast. Thank you. In the traditions of Iona Beneke people and many of the native nations of the Northeast, one of our primary ways to travel was by canoe. Those were our superhighways. And it was traditional that as you approached a village that was not yours, you would show them that you were coming and requesting permission to land, coming as a friend and not a raider. And you would do it by singing what we call a greeting song or a song to say hello and greet people as friends. So that's what I'm going to share with you right now. One of our traditional greeting sounds, kwai kwai ni don bak, means hello, my friends. Uh, and that would be what was said in the language that is a little bit more ancient than contemporary Beneke. You run you amazing. I was in upstate New York a couple of years ago and I stayed in a place called Cohoes and mm. that means apparently canoe falls down because there was a rapid or a waterfall. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I was going to see people in canoes all the time. <laughs> actually the Cohoes Falls is the tallest waterfall in the northeast, taller than my Niagara actually. And it's a very sacred place to the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people. There are a number of stories told about that. It is where the Hudson River basically can no longer be followed upstream because of those falls. Oh, how lovely. And is there a story that comes to mind about the falls? Well, the one that is best known among my cousins and my neighbors, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, is that a thousand years ago, the five nations of the Haudenosaunee were all at war with each other. And that is when the great spirit, Sonquiadiso, um, as the Haudenosaunee referred to that one, the holder up of the heavens, sent a messenger, a peacemaker, who went from nation to nation preaching peace and eventually bringing the five nations together in a league that actually was a model for the American government, the United States Constitution, draws a lot of its inspiration from the League of the Haudenosaunee. And Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding 
fathers, there were mothers too, but only the fathers get mentioned, uh, said that we should copy, we Americans should copy the League of the Haudenosaunee. And he went to meetings of the Iroquois League at the invitation of leaders of the League who felt the, uh, the 13 colonies needed to get their acts together and stop passing all these different laws and regulations that made it confusing for the native people to deal with them. So uh, in fact, one of the symbols of the United States is an eagle holding 13 arrows to the 13 colonies that is directly borrowed from the League of the Haudenosaunee where the eagle holds five arrows to stand for the five nations strong bound together. In any event, when the peacemaker went from village to village and community to community, when he got near Cohoes, the people said, we don't believe you, we think you are a phony. You're not really uh, a messenger of the creator. We need to test you. And so they told him to climb a tall pine tree above the falls. When he climbed onto that tree, they cut the branch off, it fell into the water, and he was swept over those gigantic falls. And they said, well, there goes another a phony, you know. But as they were walking back to the village, they saw smoke rising and came around a corner and there was a lodge that had never been there before. And sitting in front of it, smoking his pipe was the peacemaker. Basically said, are you ready to listen now? And they said, yes, we are ready to listen. So the Cohoes Falls is, very sacred because of that and also at the base of the falls were found the bones of a mastodon one of those giant elephant like animals that were found in north america and you know many of our traditional stories talk about the time when those creatures walked the earth with us ten thousand years ago so the memory of our stories is very long and often very powerfully connected to the natural world and also to the necessity of all of us living together in peace. That's a beautiful story. Um, so I was staying in a very auspicious place um, and the, the national park around there was really special and magical. So I definitely felt that magic around the river there and the falls and the forests. Mm -hmm. Well, the United States is very fortunate. It has a lot of areas that are still wild and we're trying our best to protect them. And fortunately, we now have a Secretary of the Interior uh, in the cabinet position who is a woman, who is Native American, who understands generations and not just presidential cycles. And so we're, we're very hopeful that Deb is going to do a, a great job of reversing some of the crazy things that have been happening over the last four years, but even before then. You see, when Europeans came to North America, they had no concept of ecology or conservation. They learned that from native people. In fact, organizations like uh, the Boy Scouts were influenced by Native American thought and traditions. And uh, something called the Audubon Society was founded by a man who was deeply impacted by his time spent among Native Americans out West. So that his, uh, George Bird Grinnell, his interest in native culture taught him a lot of things, for example, the tradition that is found in our communities is that we never kill animals that have young. A mother animal is always left alone. We do not ever take everything. We only take as much as we need. That's why there were flocks of passenger pigeons when the Europeans came, the most numerous bird in the world. And they were so tame that when they landed, you could literally walk up and knock them off the limbs with a stick and they were all wiped out by European hunters. In fact, ironically, the last flock of passenger pigeons, which numbered perhaps 100,000 birds, was completely wiped out, packed into barrels to be shipped to the east for food, and those barrels were stuck because there was a train strike, and those birds rotted in those barrels. And that is, to me, a symbol of what that lack of understanding of the natural world means, that destruction that it causes. Among my Haudenosaunee friends, I'm a Beneke, we are Algonquin speakers to the east of the Haudenosaunee, but I have some Mohawk ancestry way back there too. And among my Haudenosaunee friends, they have kept something called the passenger pigeon dance, a dance to honor that bird and remember it, even though its wings are no longer heard, a song and the dance is still done. And you're still smiling through the sadness of that story. Yes. 
But well, hopefully you can celebrate the fact that you have a lady in a position of influence now for the ecology of the country. Yes, Deb Holland is uh, from Laguna Pueblo, one of the Pueblos of the Southwest. And, you know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Gregory Cajete, who is from Santa Clara Pueblo, um, edited this book, which is called A People's Ecology. And it looks at ecology through a Native American lens, through um, agricultural traditions, through the healing power of nature. And the essays in here are ones that I would recommend anyone to take a look at because they speak about our strong relationship that must be remain, must be kept. A friend of mine, Clayton Blascoupe, who is actually Tuscarora, is one of the people who has uh, essays in this book. So I would recommend this. And the Pueblo understanding of the world is informed also by the Pueblo language. American Indian languages are very different often from European languages. And in the Puebloan languages, and there are four different primary language groups, there are concepts of change, of growth, of continuity, of flow from one thing into another. And I have been told by people who are quantum physicists that the Pueblo language is actually better suited to discuss something like quantum physics than is the English language, which is very limited in its ability unless we create new words and new concepts to understand those connections that exist. So they had a deeper understanding of the essence of life. I would say that quite frankly, um, you probably know this little book of mine called Keepers of the Earth. And it's about the way in which our traditional stories teach about science. The painting on the cover of Mother Earth was done by John Cajone Spadden, a Mohawk dear friend of mine. And this is his mother's face in this painting. And okay. the idea that when we gather people together among the Haudenosaunee, one of the great traditions is called the words spoken before all others. I'll give you a very brief example of that because I've been told by many elders such as Tom Porter of the community of Ganacha Halegi, the clean pot along the Mohawk River, that the creator, when we were put on the earth, told human beings, you must always do one thing above all others say thank you, be thankful, behave in a thankful way. If you do that, everything else will fall in place. But unfortunately, we were given another gift by the creator and that is a gift of forgetfulness. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> forget to do that. So as a result, ceremonies and traditions were given to the people to help remind them. And this is one of those traditions of the Thanksgiving address. And by the way, Thanksgiving is every day not just one day in November when a group of pilgrims decided to uh, try to uh, thank the native people who made it possible for them to survive that rough New England winter. Without them, they would never have managed to continue on. So it begins like this. And what I do is, or what always is done is, we ask those who hear this to join their minds and their hearts as well, and to be part of this. And we begin by thanking this earth, our mother, for all of the gifts that the earth gives and the way it holds us up always, no matter what we do. We give thanks to the waters that flow from the smallest streams, from the rain that falls to the great ocean, and that water that flows within our own bodies and our blood, which is carrying us onward and connecting us to all things. We give thanks to all the plants that grow to the small and the tall, to the medicine plants, the food plants, which sustain us, especially the three sisters. By the way, I'm going to say thank you right now to the water. Will you? <laughs> so will I. Thank you. Thank you for the water. And I was told by one of my elders, uh, Dewa Santa, an Onondaga elder, even when you get water from the tap, always say thank you. I'm going to start that from today. And we give thanks to the animals who are relatives, who are friends and teachers and companions on this earth and often sacrifice themselves for our survival. We give thanks to the birds who fly and with their flight remind us the spirit rises also toward the sky. We give thanks to the winds that bring us breath. We give thanks also to the great sun 
is also oh, the sun it shines and it brings warmth and light. We give thanks to Nani Bon San, the grandmother moon, the night traveler, who reminds us even in the darkness we are not alone, and though her face may disappear, it always returns. We give thanks to the distant stars, Yawatawesuk, the above ones, whose paths give us guidance. We give thanks to all the people, those we know, those we do not, those before us, those yet to come. And then we give great thanks and love to the great mystery, Kitsinawask, as we call the great mystery in the Abenaki language, the creator of all things. We give our thanks, we give our love, and I ask you to join me, my mind, my heart, my words, and say thank you, and we love you to all of creation. Thank you, and we love you, all of creation. So that is uh, something that I've kind of, you know, been part of my life for many, many decades. I was raised at a time when very little was written or said about Native people, especially by Native people themselves. And one of the reasons I became a writer was to share parts of things about our history, our traditions, our cultures that I never found in books when I was young, to share them with my children and with other children, to share them with basically people in general. That understanding and that teaching is so deep. The understanding, for example, that we are not alone on this earth, that we are fellow travelers on this planet with all other beings, and that even the stones, especially the stones, deserve respect. And the stones have a lesson to teach us as well. Uh, among our Aveniki people, our story of creation includes that the first human beings were shaped by the great mystery from stone. They were very strong and powerful, but as they walked, because their hearts were hard, they paid no attention to other life. They crushed everything beneath their feet. And so they were broken up and put back into the land. That's one reason why we have such a stony landscape here in New England. Sometimes you'll find a stone and turn it over. It looks like there's a face on it. Maybe it's one of those people who are facing the earth now and not defacing the earth. And then people were made from the ash trees. We stepped forth from the ash trees and we were rooted in the land. Our hearts were growing and green. And so it is that uh, we call ourselves the people of the ash. And we say, we must never be like those stone people. For if we are, we too may be returned to earth. In fact, all human life may be returned to earth if we crush it beneath our feet and do not have roots in the land. So that's, that's one of our Beneke stories. That's a very, very powerful message. And the ash tree is very important for Irish people as well. Yeah. The traditional hurley is made out of the ash tree um, from the bottom of the trunk down into the root. It's uh, the national sport of Ireland mm -hmm. made with a stick made from the ash tree. And unfortunately, the ash trees have a disease at the moment, which is very sad, um, called ash dieback. We've had that problem here too, and there's the uh, borer beetle that causes the death of the ash trees as well. But uh, yeah, Igrasa, and that's that great pronunciation of it, the uh, Nordic word for the tree of life from which all life springs. I, I find sometimes some really interesting uh, connections between, quite frankly, Ireland and uh, Norse lands and our Northeastern native people. In fact, and this is, I find this hilarious. They uh, found, uh, a very ancient skeleton in the Pacific Northwest and they tested the DNA and they said, oh, it's European. So clearly it wasn't Native American. But the point is most of the DNA from Algonquin people has the same markers as the markers you'll find in Ireland, in um, the Norse people. And I think it's because quite frankly, people went back and forth for thousands of years Brendan was not the only one, uh, nor was Eric the Red, but people, it wasn't that far to go from one to the other. In fact, Columbus's navigators were all Basques and the Basques were fishing off the North banks of North America within 20 years of Columbus. There were Basque fishing boats there, but guess what? I think they were there before. Uh -huh. Fishermen don't tell people where their best fishing pot is. So uh, those connections between our people is very strong. In fact, I did a book called The Native American Sweat Lodge and traditional stories about sweat lodges, which is a means of purification, of connecting your mind, your body, your spirit, your emotions, and connecting back to the earth as well. For when you're within the sweat lodge, it's like you're back in your mother's body, back in the earth. You emerge cleansed and ready to face a new day. Uh, 
you probably know this, but there were sweat lodges in Ireland um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It was an option a thousand years ago, but the British outlawed the sweat lodge. The British actually wiped out the sweat lodge in Ireland. And there is documentation of this. So you might find that interesting. That is interesting. I'll look into that. Yeah, I mean, we do feel very close to um, America from, we're right on the Western edge of Ireland. Oh, and yeah. pe people say they can smell the hamburgers in New York. <laughs> well, you know, the, the other thing too, is that there is that long connection between the Americas and Ireland because the uh, potato that was unfortunately only one variety of the dozens and dozens, actually hundreds of varieties of potatoes are found in South America, but only one variety was cultivated. And so when this particular disease struck it and wiped them out, but again, uh, two things which I find interesting. And you know this, I'm sure. Ireland was still exporting other food to England at the time of the famine, interestingly enough. And secondly, that native people on this continent raised money. Yes. So, Foundation in particular was known for having done that. Yes. Would you like to tell us the st there, there's actually a statue in Cork of some beautiful silver feathers um, of the indigenous people in America sent money to the Irish uh, during the time of the famine. Yeah, and the simple story that my uh, Choctaw friends tell me is that they themselves had been dispossessed. They'd been set off their land in the South. But when they heard about what happened to the Irish people, uh, they said, well, <laughs> they also need help. We understand what that is like. So they raised whatever they could. It wasn't a lot of money, but for them, it was a lot of money at that time. For they were not wealthy people, and they sent it to Ireland. A lot of great, great kindness. I'll put it in the show notes um, yeah. with a link, because it's a really beautiful uh, sculpture and honor to the people that sent, sent over the funds. I see um, there's a connection in another way, too, because traditional agriculture, whether it was traditional agriculture in Ireland or the traditional agriculture of the Americas, is a cyclical agriculture. It's an awareness of what we take out, we put back in. We don't fertilize it to death. We don't poison the soil. We don't try to kill all the other creatures around. In fact, often in Native American gardens, an area might be set aside for the animals or for the birds. So they would take their share, but they wouldn't take the share that was for all of the others. And the understanding that we are related, in fact, in our traditions, when you um, kill a game animal, let's say a deer, you say, thank you, and may you continue to run. When we take a bird, thank you, may you continue to fly. A fish, thank you, may you continue to swim. For the understanding is that we do not kill the spirit, we take simply the meat. And if we do it properly and with respect, those animals will allow themselves to be taken again. In fact, when I was up in Baffin Island in 1992, collecting stories among the uh, Inuit people up there, uh, Lukasi Nutraluk, who was a great hunter, he told me he had hunted everything on land and everything on the ocean and uh, always showed it respect. He told me this story. He said there was a hunter who was going out in his umiak, his canoe, and he was heading towards an ice floe where there were walrus. And as he paddled toward that ice floe, a walrus swam up to his umiak and said, you may take me. And the hunter looked at that walrus and saw that one of its tusks was crooked and yellow. And the hunter said, no, you are not good enough. I want one that is good. And he continued on out to the ice floe. When he got there, all the walrus were gone. And he never, ever successfully hunted another walrus again. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I wonder if you've heard this story, Joe. Um, it was about 30 years ago and an American bald-headed eagle flew over to the Burren in Ireland, which is just where I am, mm -hmm. uh, by mistake. It got caught on the winds of the, right. I can't remember what you call that wind that comes across. And it ended up in completely the wrong place. The National Parks and Wildlife people caught him up and put him on a plane in Shannon and took him back to America. And subsequently, um, three chiefs came over to the Burren and 
I happen to know this because the next day I visited a lady in a roundhouse to get some herbs off her and she said you'll never guess what happened yesterday. Um, three chiefs from America knocked on my door because they saw my house as a roundhouse and gave a peace ceremony. <laughs> and they'd come to, they said the barn must be a special place because the eagle had come over and they wanted to come and visit. Did That's you cool. ever hear that story? I haven't heard that story. I wonder who the chiefs were. They might be people I know. They well, Ch the Choctaw was mentioned. So yeah. I'm not sure if I have that right. No. But maybe you could ask, because I'd love to follow it up from their side. If I can find something about that, because it sounds like exactly what someone would do. Uh, I had a friend named uh, Chief Jake Swamp, and uh, he was Mohawk and an elder. And we have this tradition that when the League of Peace was founded, a pine tree was planted as a tree of peace. And the eagle sat on top of that tree. And the tree had four white roots that stretched to every direction. And anyone could trace those roots and stand under that tree in peace. That is a very, very powerful tradition. So what Jake did during his lifetime, he passed away about eight years ago, maybe 10 now. Um, I lost track of time with this pandemic, <laughs> but uh, Jake traveled all over the world. He traveled to conflict areas. He traveled to Palestine and Israel. He traveled to Russia and Siberia. He traveled to South America and Central America and Australia. And everywhere he went, he planted a symbolic tree of peace and told that story. And then had four children chosen uh, from the group. And each one had a ribbon, a white ribbon, a red ribbon, a brown ribbon, and a yellow ribbon to stand for the four major racial or national groups of the globe. And they each came up and tied their ribbon onto that tree to symbolize peace between all people, that all of us are connected in peace. So the pine tree is a very powerful uh, symbol for us in many ways. In fact, it has five needles. We say that stands for the five nations that join together. And uh, among our Beneke people, we actually have a song that we sing called Little Pines. And that song um, is about how the pine trees stretch out their limbs and the little pines are protected by those limbs so they can grow up. They're not crushed by the snow or broken by the wind. And of course, it is a metaphor for the children that the children like those little pines are protected by the elders. and. Uh, it's a song that among our Abeniki people was sung by the children to their mothers and then their mothers had to dance while they were singing. And- uh, oh, How lovely. Uh, it's not, it, uh, it sounds, sounds like this. I'll do it on a flute first. Flute songs can be sung just the way it works. It goes. Mom and Joe talk, who says, go to us? I don't jump talk, who says, go to us? I don't jump talk, who says, go to us? I don't jump talk, who says, go to us? Pray high one day, oh, pray high one day, oh, pray high one day, oh. And uh, tutuage means little pines or little ones or small children and telling them to dance around in each of the directions. The song is a lot longer than that. <laughs> that was so <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. You were so lucky to hear that. Would the pine tree be one of your favorite plants? Pines are very important. In fact, uh, the pine tree, if you take the inner bark, it can be dried and ground up and made into flour. Uh, the needles of the pine tree can be steeped in boiling water to produce a tea that's good for coughs and fevers. And uh, other parts of the tree are used in various ways. So it is really a, a very, um, well, the thing is, everything has many ways of being used. Sometimes just the shade or the way it sings in the wind is a use of that tree as well. So uh, it can be inspirational. It can be actual food for you. Uh, it can provide shelter in many ways. And a huge pine trunk could be carved out into a dugout canoe. My sons and I have made uh, dugout canoes, some big pine, uh, big pine logs, and uh, 
that have fallen in the wind and then we salvaged it and made a, a dugout canoe. In fact, we have one that's been shown in three different museums here in the Northeast. They keep borrowing our <laughs> dugout canoe as if it were something special. <laughs> <laughs> and have you been on some trips in the canoe? Is it, is it river worthy? It's okay, but it's a little tippy. <laughs> A little tippy. Actually, I prefer the birch bark canoes. We have a couple of those too in our outdoor education center and we use them. We'll actually be using them in some filming we're doing next week of a historical film on our property. Oh, That's lovely. There's so many things I want to ask you, especially about your place. Uh, but I just can't, um, I have to ask you about the bear behind you um, because I know the bear is a special animal to you. Yeah, the bear is actually our clan animal. Um, my sons and I are members of the bear clan. In fact, I'm wearing a, a bear claw necklace. And uh, the bear has many things about it that are important for people to remember. One is that a bear always cares for its children. We human beings forget to do that. And a bear, um, a bear can be very compassionate. Uh, my friend, Nora Dauenhauer, who has since passed on, who was a clinket, uh, storyteller and playwright and writer, poet, wonderful person from Southeast Alaska from the Tlingit Nation, told me that uh, one year she was out picking berries with her little granddaughter and she was on one side of a stream and the granddaughter was on another. And the granddaughter approached some berry bushes and suddenly out of those berry bushes, a huge bear stood up. This is one of those Alaskan brown bears. They're something like 10 feet tall and they stand up towering over that little girl. And Nora said she walked down to the edge of the stream and she began to speak to that bear. In Clinket, she began to say, I'm sorry if my granddaughter has disturbed you. Please take pity on her. You're an elder, do not harm her. And that bear kind of looked at her and nodded its head and turned around, dropped down on all fours and disappeared back into the berry bushes. Oh, that was so touching. Um, would you tell us about your place and what you do there? Yes, we live in Greenfield Center, New York, which is uh, in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. We have a 90 acre nature preserve that's been in my family for many generations. My mother put it into a conservation easement, the first conservation easement in the county we live in. And my father was a taxidermist and had a lot of connections with native people because of that, including my mother whom we married. He was Slovak and her family is Beneke and English and a few other things as well. Uh, and uh, my son James decided with my mom's blessing that he would start teaching traditional skills there. He was fortunate enough to work with a good friend of mine named John Stokes. John is a man who teaches tracking. He has something called the Tracking Project which is located in Corrales, New Mexico. And John has worked with indigenous elders all over the world. Australia, where he learned tracking from an elder named Uncle Jimmy Johnson, Australia's most foremost Aboriginal tracker. He's traveled to South America and he came back to the United States because he wanted to work with our indigenous people and work with them to not just track animals, but as he put it, to bring the pieces back together to uh, restore that balance to help them do that within their communities. And so we teach these things like tracking, but it's also respect for the natural world and awareness of the natural world and the survival of all things, including our native languages. My son, Jesse, is a very fluent speaker of the Ibeniki language, although he'll say after, you know, more than 30 years of intensive study, I I'm not that good, but he really is. And he's actually the director of the new Abenaki, School of Abenaki at Middlebury College in Vermont, which has an immersion program. But there at our outdoor education center on that 90 acres, we teach things like uh, animal tracking, uh, plant identification, how to do things in a way that does not disturb the environment, to try to move through nature the way a fish moves through the water, leaving only ripples behind. And to also um, understand what the balance is between mind and body and spirit, which is the four areas that we focus upon. We work with kids, we work with adults. We teach orienteering, we teach uh, classes in uh, wilderness first aid, very necessary. We teach, actually, we have an entire martial arts program. We have our own dojo there. And uh, all three of us are black belts, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, 
and a couple other uh, martial arts that we also teach there. And oh, it sounds amazing. It's a pretty special place. And we're now getting back to doing outdoor programs. Uh, we had to close down pretty much, although we did a lot of things online and we do traditional storytelling. And once a year, although not this past year or this year, we do a large Native American festival in Saratoga Springs, a nearby city. And uh, this is the program guide for it. Lovely. And, uh, we have about 4,000 people a day come to that festival. Wow, and can anybody attend the festival? Open to anyone. And this mm -hmm. booklet has information about uh, the native histories. For example, the Mohican people. Here you see a Mohican wigwam. Okay. And uh, we, like all powwows, they're meant for the world. A powwow is a circle. Everyone is welcome to come and learn and share and engage in commerce because people make things and sell them at powwows and including really great food. Oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, what is your favorite um, indigenous food? I'd have to say it's Three Sisters soup, which is soup made with corn and beans and squash. But anything to do with corn is uh, really wonderful. And I find that it's an important plant all through the Americas. And it was in Del it actually uh, created, or you should say um, developed through agronomists who are Native American in the Valley of Mexico where it first originated. And whereas Europeans specialized in domesticating animals, our native people on the North and South American continent specialize in understanding the plant life. And in many cases, using it to produce uh, sustainable agriculture. And there's very sustainable agriculture in our traditional ways of doing things. Lovely. Um, what's your most profound experience you've had in the natural world? Well, I should say that I became interested in nature as a small child and I began reading everything I could get my hands on. You'd asked in that email you sent me who I read. Well, Roger Torrey Peterson, who was a great naturalist, uh, Edwin Way Teal, books like uh, Autumn Across America, North of the Spring, Fabre's books, uh, translated, of course, from French into English about the insect world. So as a very small kid, I paid close attention. And in fact, my desire in life was to become a naturalist. And I went to Cornell University and majored in wildlife conservation, then began taking writing courses and realized I also wanted to write about it and then ended up going on and getting a master's degree in creative writing. And, and you've, written, you've written 120 books. Well, no, it's actually uh -huh. 170 now. <laughs> 170. 470, yeah. <laughs> Five that just came out and four more that are coming out soon. So I'm uh, actually, it's, it's not me. I have a twin brother. I keep him chained in the basement to a word processing system. And every now and then I give him some gruel and a little raw meat. And he keeps churning these things out for me while I'm you're just, you know, looking pretty on that. Oh, that, that's very, that's handy, very handy. It is good to have that kind of thing. But joking aside, I've had so many profound experiences within the natural world. It would be hard to know where to start, but I think I would share this one. Uh, a dear friend of mine named Swift Eagle, who was one of my friends and teachers, a Pueblo elder, who lived in upstate New York because he worked in a tourist attraction called Frontier Town. He had been a Hollywood Indian before that. And then he uh, was from Santo Domingo Pueblo. And I've actually met members of his family when I visited the Pueblo of Santo Domingo. Um, he and I were traveling one night. He would come with me when I did programs and it started to rain, it was May, and frogs and toads started to cross the road. And he said, stop the car. They got out, they began to pick them up and put them to the side of the road. Finished, we continued on, more frogs and toads. We stopped, we got out, picked them up, began putting them on the side of the road. And uh, I finally said to him, you know, we've really, we've got places to go, we're gonna be late. And uh, he said, they've got places to go too. So I ended up writing a poem called Birdfoot's Grandpa, which is now being anthologized more than a hundred times. And it, it goes, uh, the old man must have stopped our car two dozen times to climb out, gather into his hands, the small toads blinded by our lights, leaping live drops of rain accept it. We've got places to go. You can't save them all, I said. 
but knee deep in the summer road side grass, hands full of wet brown life. He just smiled and said, they've got places to go to too. So that was one experience with Swift Eagle. The other one is that um, late in his life, he said to me, you know, Joe, one day I'm gonna have to walk on, but you know, the fox is my little animal. So one day after I've gone, you'll see a fox and you'll know. So about two months after he passed, I was walking in the woods in our preserve and I came to a clearing and stood there for a minute and a fox came walking out into the center of the clearing, stopped about 10 feet from me, sat down and yawned and looked up at me. And I sang it the song that Swift Eagle had taught me. And the fox kind of listened, then it nodded, then it turned around and went back into the forest. I actually wrote a, a children's book called Fox Song, which is based on that experience. So uh, that's just with Swift Eagle. Beautiful, really, really beautiful. I could, I'd love you to talk all day, but don't want to completely take up your whole day. Um, have you any suggestions for people that they can do to support nature these days? Well, the creator gave us with two ears and two eyes. We need to listen twice as much as we talk. We need to look before we do something. And I think it's important to listen and to look, to really be aware and not just walk through life like those stone people, unheeding of anything you crush under your feet. And we as human beings have this special gift. We have the gift to change things. We can also change ourselves. It's a great power, but that power is often misused. So uh, within our native traditions, and I'll use the Haudenosaunee example again, since I'm talking so much about my, my Haudenosaunee friends and teachers. It is said that we have two minds. We have the good mind, we have the twisted mind. Pay attention to what mind you are in. And the twisted mind in American Indian Sign Language, this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean crazy, this means angry or selfish, You're just within yourself. But pay attention to that because you can change your mind. Within Haudenosaunee tradition, when they formed the League of the Iroquois, the one person who stood strongest against it was the chief of the Onondaga named Tadadaho. He, had, he was so evil, he had snakes growing out of his hair. And uh, what happened was they sang to him, all the people together, a song of peace, and he could not move. And then Iontuatha Hiawatha, you may know that name, who was the uh, great companion and helper of the peacemaker, along with a woman named Jigon Sase, the mother of peace. They came up to that one called Taradaho, and they straightened his body. And then Hiawatha, whose name Iontuatha means the comber, took a bone comb and combed the snakes out of Taradaho's hair. And then that man who had been evil, sort of like a Saddam Hussein character, was set up as the head of the Iroquois League, the one who would convene the League's meetings because now his mind was straight. So the fact that you can make your mind straight, that you don't have to be in that selfish mode, that there is the possibility for restoring that balance. In fact, um, I'll show you this, not just my ear, but also, <laughs> <laughs> this is my newest book. It's a picture book from Wisdom Tales Press. Wisdom Tales is a wonderful publisher. It's the story of the coming of the peacemaker, and it is illustrated by David Gonita Galon Fadden, who is the grandson of my friend Dahana Dolan's Ray Fadden, who was one of my teachers. And the illustrations in this book are so beautifully done. You can see um, the uh, depth and the sound. Oh, really, really great, yeah. And he also has uh, the uh, picture of the peacemaker. Here is Hiawatha combing the snakes from his hair. Oh, that looks like a lovely book. We'll put all those in the show notes, make sure everybody can, can find them. Um, if you had that magic wand, what would you like to do for the planet? Well, I think I'd wear it out. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there are just so many places and so many things that need to be done. 
Uh, I think that you could begin with our leaders, try to make them think not just of themselves, but of others first. They need to comb their hair. And they need to comb their hair. And that's not just a metaphor. <laughs> uh, yes, they need to take off their wigs and comb them and put them back. No, I'm not going to say that. That's not anything to do with Boris Johnson. I don't even know who Boris Johnson is. So I couldn't make a joke about him. That's not at all possible. <laughs> but the idea of changing the minds of people, making it possible for minds to be changed and everything else can fall in place if you are thankful and behave in a thankful way. Uh, a friend of mine um, who was a wonderful uh, medicine person, her name was uh, Twyla Nitsch of the Seneca Nation. She said, there are four questions you should always be asking yourself. The first one is, how do you feel about what you're doing right now? Good, I feel great. The second <laughs> one is, what are you doing that's adding to the confusion? <laughs> The third one is, um, what can you do to restore peace and balance? And the fourth one is, how will you be remembered after you have gone? And those four questions are very simple, but I think they're very clear and they relate in so many ways. It's like dropping a stone in the water and the ripples go very far and very wide. I think that's a beautiful image to leave with people. Um, I just would like to ask, how can people contact you? Or would you tell us the name of your nature preserve? The Ndakina Education Center, which no one ever can pronounce, but it's N-D-A-K-I-N-N-A, -N -N Ndakina Education Center. And you can actually go online to ndakinacenter.org. That's N-D-A-K-I-N-N-A. C-E-N-T-E-R dot O-R-G. I have a website uh, hidden under the name of Joseph Bruchak. So if you can manage to find that, good luck. I also have a Twitter account also cleverly concealed under the name of Joseph Bruchak. And so too, my Facebook page is inaccessible to anyone who cannot spell Joseph Bruchak. <laughs> I also have a, a little YouTube channel we've just started. I've only got a few songs up on it, but uh, I record music and uh, I, I do music as well as storytelling. And so uh, there's that, there's my YouTube channel. And on YouTube, you can find also some of the storytelling programs I've done with my son, Jesse, my son, Jim. And our center tries every six or eight weeks to do a storytelling program online. And it's available to anyone. If you wanna to donate to our center, that's great, but you don't have to. And uh, you'll find that under ndakinacenter.org. And we just did one for the, uh, maple season, the season when the maple trees uh, give their syrup. And we did one for the end of winter and we'll be doing one for the uh, time of planting before too long. So yeah. you can be looking for that. Thank you, we will look for that. Um, and thank you for leaving everybody with such powerful and important messages. And also for being such a bright spark and full of joy. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been my pleasure, and I wish you all good luck. May all go well for you. May all go well. May the road rise up to greet you. Thank you for listening to Nature Magic. I'm sure you enjoyed this episode with the wonderful Dr. Joseph Krushek. He's guaranteed to improve your day, and we were very honored to have him as a guest. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends to spread a positive voice for nature. If you wish to support the podcast, we now have a Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash nature magic. We will include the link in the show notes and also Joe's recommendations for books and links to his sanctuary and his website. <laughs>